Welcome to the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mario Mocha, New Mexico State Athletic Director. Mario, thanks for being on the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, you were only, you're one of only probably a handful of sitting athletic directors that get the opportunity to lead their athletic department, where they're not only the alma mater, but you're also a former athlete, a baseball player at New Mexico State. Uh, so it always makes me curious when I see situations like this. Was the AD chair at your institution always the plan? And what was going through the, your mind when you saw or heard the position was opening? Because I think you're at your last position for almost a decade. Yeah, you know, I have never been like a job hopper, like, hey, I've got to get to X in my career or else it'll be unfilled or I won't be happy. Uh, you know, I got hooked up with a guy named Mike Alden. Uh, so I played ball. I played the minor leagues for the Tigers for a few years. And after I got released, uh, I went and got my master's degree at University of New Mexico, of all places. And I worked for the Lobos for four and a half years. Well, Mike Alden, uh, you know, was my supervisor's supervisor. Uh, he got the AD's job at Southwest Texas, which is now Texas State, brought me along with him. He left after two years to Missouri to become the AD. He brought me six months later. And I was at Mizzou for, shoot, eight years as well, you know, moved up to senior associate, it was called then. And then, you know, it's interesting you ask, this is where the, where, um, and I'm not, Lord knows, Russ Bjork and I worked together at Mizzou. I'm good friends with Chris Del Conte, but this is where things kind of took different paths. I took an FCS job because at the time in 06, it wasn't, you know, as clearly defined as, boy, that's a lower level situation. You know, they were similar. So I took that and, um, you know, I was there for over eight years and I loved our time in Carbondale, um, had the kids, uh, we, we have lifelong friends there, but it became very hard. You got, you got pegged as an FCS AD and I'm like, wait, I was the number two guy at Missouri for eight years. Um, so I was very interested. I thought we did about all we could do in Carbondale. We built $90 million worth of facilities, went to Sweet 16, you know, went to national semifinals in football. And when this job came open, boy, I was familiar with it because I had went to school here. It was close to the Southwest where I grew up, which is Phoenix, Arizona. And um, quite frankly, I thought, hey, as an alum um, and with my resume, I'd at least have a good shot at getting it. Um, so I did. And it was back to FBS. Um, and I did, you know, I got the job in January of 2015. And, you know, six plus years later, we're still kind of inventing stuff to do. And, uh, you know, I personally think we've moved the needle um, with some really good um, sports moments as well as, you know, kind of just revitalized the department. I mean, everybody knows in the industry, New Mexico State's a tough job, right? But uh, at the end of the day, I wanted to kind of inject us into the national conversation, certainly not like Notre Dame or Clemson, but a little more than what we were getting. And I, I hope we've done that. Yeah, we'll get into some of your revenue generation uh, in a little bit. But um, yeah, with I mean, it's definitely needed with uh, the where higher education is, because I know you all were getting uh, budget cuts as well as as, as other departments at your university. But um, you, you kind of touched on something that of a research interest of mine. You know, I've been just like you probably follow all these AD changes. And it's now pretty much if you get to if you're an FCS AD, you typically stay there. Um, or you could be, you know, like we, we've seen a sitting AD go to be a power five deputy AD uh, recently. Sure. And so I'm, I'm going to be studying the, the trends and where people are going. And it seems like there's a lot more internal hires. Um, speaking about the differences, since you've been at different levels, uh, when not in a global pandemic or dealing with, uh, you know, things like right now, like NIL, what is a typical day or week like for you as an AD at that institution that you're at now? And do you think the job has changed forever as an AD because of the changes to higher ed and college athletics? Yeah, I think um, to answer your second question, yeah, I think the job has fundamentally changed, you know, uh, but life is about change, right? If you stop moving, you you kind of perish. Um, So I don't think it's the end of the world, but yeah, it is going to be different. Uh, What's unique, you know, when you're in a school like New Mexico State and you're on the lower uh, resource. And, you know, uh, Patty Viverito, who was the uh, commissioner of the Missouri Valley Football Conference, always said, hey, the upper end of the FCS is better funded than the lower end of the FBS. And she's not wrong in that regard. I mean, you look at like a North Dakota state 
or some of these other places. And I think they have a little bit more of a robust, you know, situation than we do. Um, what I find that's different is we don't really have the staff. I'm always like, God, I always have like 400 emails that I'm trying to whittle down to a hundred. And I talk to my counterparts and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm down to 25. I'm down to 30. Well, that's because they have so much staff to handle things. Um, as the AD, I kind of handle everything from the personnel issues to licensing issues to you name it, because um, we just don't have the staff to do what we want to do. Now, trust me, I create my own problems sometimes because I'm always wanting to do this stuff. And that's when all the emails come in. We could very easily say, hey, we don't have the staff. Let's just do this. But I don't think we'd be doing ourselves a service if that's what we did. You know, we've got to try to do everything and, and, and be positive and get our message out because we're in a smaller place with limited media. So uh, that's the biggest difference to me. Just um, all every AD job is busy and hectic and things like that. And they're certainly different with the level of scrutiny. Uh, but you do do a lot of other things um, here than I think you do in other places. Yeah, I'm still friends with a lot of people that I worked with at Indiana State. Um, so I was at Indiana State for three years, and, and I was a D2 at University of Indianapolis for three years before I came to IU. And um, so you're talking about three con- incredibly different levels of institutions. And I'm just thinking about all the work that um, all this NIL stuff having to go on, too, on top of being in a pandemic and um, higher ed cuts and things like that. It's just uh, the the lower level uh, lower budget level FBS and FCS institutions. It's just, I don't know how you all do it, but um, it's, uh, it's obviously takes a lot to, to get done. And that's why you have to be creative, I'm guessing. Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, yeah, this um, latest, you know, we've been dealing with what the transfer issue, cost of attendance, the nutrition issue, you know, all these changes that have financial implications um, and not, you know, the transfer uh, and NIL and, you know, the other things that are going to come down the pike. Yeah, they've been very, um, you know, we're looking at ourselves. And, you know, since you brought it up, it's interesting. You know, we were one of the early states to adopt um, the NIL legislation. Senator Mark Moores, who's actually a former offensive lineman for the Lobos, um, and he's a friend of mine, you know, he crafted it. Uh, I personally don't think that the legislation is perfect, um, you know, from a couple of hanging chads there, but um, I have no, I am not one of those people who are against athletes monetizing themselves, um, you know, as long as it's done in the right way. Um, so I'm, I'm positive about it, but there are so many questions and I see these schools, Hey, we just signed with this company and we also signed with this company, you know, for education and for opportunities. I'm like, wow, uh, I still don't have money to do what I would consider extras. Now, I'm not saying this is an extra, this might be a half do, but I can't just go out there and sign companies because, you know, it'll look good or, Hey, look, New Mexico state isn't being left behind. Um, We've really got to use our dollars widely. And I almost never say, Hey, we've got to do this just for appearances sake. But this is one of those times I almost said, Hey, I think we almost have to sign with somebody for appearances sake to make it look like we're doing something now if we sign with somebody in August, I mean, is the world going to stop spinning? No. Could an athlete go out and get a deal in that time? And we wouldn't know. But at the end of the day, um, I don't think that at New Mexico State and Las Cruces that the sky is going to fall, um, you know, on July 1st. Um, so we're still having discussions and we want to make the right move for us. Yeah, there's just so many companies out there. And, um, you know, and I'm, so today I was in a, uh, when I'm recording this, I had to uh, take my wife, just, we just got a new minivan, about to have a third boy. So we got to switch to a minivan. So I uh, got the, we just bought it. They're putting new tires and changed the brakes on it. And so I'm sitting in there for two hours with my laptop. And uh, I, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm seeing all these names come out of these creative NIL program names. And, um, and uh, I was like, I'm going to put a spreadsheet together of all the D1 schools and I'm going to create the NIL program name. And I'm also going to keep track of who they're, uh, they're partnering with and try and see a trend. And what I've noticed is about half the power five haven't come out with it at all. Not very many FBS in general have necessarily come up with a catchy name, but the ones that have just, so if you do create an NIL program name, I don't think you have a program name yet, right? Do not. 
So you got to, you, according to what I found, it has to be one word and it's got to be bold letters, capital letters only. So you got to have a one syllabus, one word, and it's got to be all caps. So there's some marketing advice based on my. Well, uh, I, I was hoping advice. you were going to give me a suggestion on what that word would be, but. Uh, I will. I'll, that'll, we'll, uh, we'll look into that after the podcast. I'll, I'll try to get creative. I am going to rank like the top like 20 of creativity. But, you know, I got to play Homer and I'm going to leave the number one spot open for IU whenever we announce ours. Um, but but two through 19, two through 20 is wide open. But it, right. it is interesting because you're starting to see people pair up with three or four companies. Yeah. And it's just I've never heard of some of these companies until um, I think some bigger companies are doing spinoffs, divisions for college athletics. So I'm not saying they're bad or they're good. I don't I don't think anyone knows. I mean, so it'd be interesting. Yeah. It can't I mean, be cheap. You know, yeah. And, you know, part of my, you know, thought process is, okay, the NCA has allowed the student athletes to do this. And of course, you know, they're young people, we want them to do it the right way. And we want them to get good opportunities. But, you know, now the department has to spend more resources to what help the athletes go find deals. I mean, can't they do that themselves? Like they have the ability to do that. But now like the onus is not going to get put back on me to find them these deals, right? Um, also now, you know, I have to expend more dollars to make sure that the reporting and the education is right. And it's like, gee whiz, um, you know, it kind of strikes me as like an unfunded mandate. Hey, we're going to let this happen, but we're not going to give you any new dollars to, you know, either help police it or help educate it or help grow it. I've got to come up with that. And I understand that, but my dollars are so limited. You know, I'm trying to make sure our student athletes can travel and can have uniforms and can do that. So anything that I do on this side might impact the entire group on the other side. Once again, I'm not begrudging them for making money and making as much money as they can. I'm just saying that I have limited funds for the entire group and I have to be very careful on how I do that. Just so, um, you know, we had a high profile situation with our men's basketball coach. She was, you know, being courted by UTEP, you know, 30 miles down the street. Well, we retained him, but we spent this much money in retaining him. I came up with all private dollars, you know, from the public private sector. So when I say we don't have a whole lot of money, I mean, if we don't have a whole lot, any money to give to our basketball coach, who's, you know, winning, you know, 28 games every year, um, you know, I'm not being surprised. being realistic. Be the right word. Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, um, but it'll be interesting. You know, I, I think things are going to, things will, will uh, happen um, organically and then we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens. But we will, I am sure, align ourselves with the company once we have a little bit more of a handle on what the opportunities are, what we need to be looking out for. And it would be nice to get some data, you know, when this thing just first gets started. Yeah, right now it's just who's on your list. And so um, it'll be interesting to see how it all pans out for sure. And, and you're just being realistic with it because I, I put my, I, I put my thought process on, I mean, all I do is eligibility and transfer evaluation. So obviously I got enough on my hands. I just sit back and watch the NIL stuff. Uh, but I think back to my time at Indiana state versus at IU and the resources, you can't lie. They're 45 minutes down the road from each other, but it's day and night on resources. Yeah. And so that's just the, the hand you're dealt. And, um, yeah, you know, to get away from NIL for a minute and uh, talk about football. And so another question I want to talk about is, as a football independent, is it you, the head coach, or actually, let me go back a minute. Is there a long-term strategy for football to either remain as an independent or join another conference? Because I know that the WAC, for those that are listening, the WAC is out of the question as uh, they're now going to return to the FCS level for football. And you all are obviously going to want to stay at the FBS level, but <clears throat> Is there a, a decision to be made? And if you are invited to join an FBI, FBS conference, what would the institution have to consider uh, if you're fielding those offers and the invitations? Um, the institution would probably have to consider how fast I could get there to sign the paperwork. Um, yeah, I think it is a goal uh, of New Mexico State to get back into an FBS conference. Um, we know there is only five, and I guess if you want to argue four, depending on what your um, thought process is on the American. Um, you know, a lot of people know that we were, as an affiliate, you know, asked to leave the, um, 
um, Sun Belt, or you know, they did not renew our affiliation with them. So I, I don't really see going back to them as a possibility. The Mid America Conference is obviously, you know, gen, you know, bus league very tightly geographic. I don't see that as a possibility. So that only leaves two, right? The Mountain West and Conference USA. Now, theoretically, you know, might those conferences align themselves more geographically and might we have a place in there down the road? All that stuff is great parlor talk and possibility, but, um, you know, we will certainly keep our eye on the tea leaves. We've actually, um, the university hired a consultant, um, Jeff Schimmel's group, to kind of assist us in this area. So now we know that the tectonic plates need to shift a little bit for us to get in there, but um, it's not impossible that that happens. Um, you did mention the Western Athletic Conference, and we did add um, two schools last year, Dixie State and Tarleton State. And this year, what, in two more days, um, you know, we'll have Lamar University, Abilene Christian, Stephen F. Austin, and Sam Houston come in. Um, those are all FBS playing schools that I mentioned. So that's six. And I know, and I won't name names, but there is a desire for some of those institutions to look at transitioning to the FBS level. That's exciting for me because that may open up uh, a possibility, you know, for the WAC just to become an FBS league, right? If, they, if all those schools transition. So, you know, we've had a lot of the current WAC members transition from Division II to Division I over the years, whether it's Seattle, Grand Canyon, Utah Valley, um, you know, now Tarleton and Dixie, you know, they're all transitioning. This is a different form of transitioning, but uh, if you've got those six schools, you know, we're, uh, we're a football playing school. That's seven while we're independent. Um, you know, UTRGV, um, Texas Rio Grande Valley has discussed football. You know, a few years ago, they hired uh, Mac Brown and Oliver Luck to, um, you know, do like a, a study. So, um, you know, that is a realistic possibility that the WAC, when they have, when we get going in a few days, that those schools, um, I know some are very aggressive. Some are, are just out there. I think the big question is, will the schools that are aggressive be able to convince the schools who may not be aggressive, hey, let's all do this and let's all transition together. And uh, I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the president's thoughts of those institutions are too. And I think Southern Utah moved to the mat, uh, to the WAC, right? And so, well, uh, Southern Utah will come into the uh, Western Athletic Conference not this year, but next year. So they'll come in officially uh, July of 2022. So we're a 13-team league right now. We've got Chicago State. Um, they will depart after this season, and then Southern Utah will take their place. And what's exciting about them, you know, Southern Utah has won a Big Sky championship in football, actually a couple, I think, semi-recently. And, um, you know, obviously Sam Houston winning the FCS national championship. I just personally think, and this is, I say this, not, be, not speaking for any of those institutions, but when I was at Southwest Texas in 1997 and 1998, I think some of those schools remember playing against them and now they're Texas state and they've got all these facilities and they're on ESPN and they're, you know, eligible for bowl games. And if I was some of those Texas schools, I'm like, well, Hey, that could be me, you know, same as UTSA and same as North Texas, you know, they've kind of moved up and moved up successfully. So I, I do think there's an opportunity um, and I'm hopeful that it works out that way. Yeah, I had the Southern Utah president on my podcast uh, last year, and he just left um, the institution, or the, he will at the end of this uh, uh, end of June, to take a job at the um, their state's higher ed association. But so it'd be interesting to see, like, when new presidents come in, where they come from, and what their thought process is. Yeah. Um, um, but that'd be interesting. And then, as a football independent, is it something I've always I try to be tactical, and some people might not know this, and I'm not sure about it. Is it you, the head coach, another senior level athletic administrator, or all of you discussing and coming to an agreement on an actual schedule? Yeah. I imagine, I mean, you don't have half your game scheduled for you. Right. Good question. 
Um, you know, we're unique at New Mexico State where we've got five games already taken care of, right? We know from a budgetary standpoint, we have to play two by games. That's just, a, that's been a have to here. Um, also, and geography 99% of the time works against us in Las Cruces, but this is working for us, is that um, we play UNM and UTEP every single year in football. So there's four games there and we're going to schedule an FCS. So, you know, while it looks like, you know, that question, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time? I mean, hey, the 12 games is like, oh, my God. It's like, eh, now there's only seven that you have to deal with. Now, scheduling seven games is not easy, but, um, you know, we, we certainly – I don't have to meet with my head football coach to know – to say that, hey, we would love to play a group of five teams that we have the best ability to have a shot at winning, okay? So we're not looking at Boise. You know, we're not looking at, you know, Memphis or Cincinnati, um, so we try to get realistic like opponents as much as possible. And, um, there's been two people, Dave Brown, um, Dave is the CEO of gridiron and Dave was the old ESPN college football, you know, vice president of programming. He would put the games together, right. For ESPN. And when he hung out his shingle, um, he's got this so this complex software called gridiron and you can see, who's looking for games and who's looking for buy games and what they've paid in the past and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm a technophobe. What we pay for annually is the ability to call Dave Brown up at any time. He knows every single person's cell number. And what Dave brings to the table is not just hooking me up with an AD that I may not know. Dave has the ability through his background to call the conference schedulers and say, hey, Sunbelt, can you move Louisiana, Lafayette, and Troy up two weeks so they can play New Mexico State because they really need to do a game? And they're like, yeah, we can do that. That's invaluable. That is something I can't do. You know, he calls the Mountain West. Hey, could you slide this in here and da-da-da so so-and-so can get a game? Um, he is worth his weight in gold, in platinum, silver, whatever. And then my deputy AD and CEO, Bron Cartwright, who I always say is the smartest man in Las Cruces, um, he puts all the pieces together, you know, trying to get the bye weeks, this, that, and the other. So, you know, philosophically, you know, first you look at other independents. Like, and if I'm New Mexico State, I'm just being candid with you. Well, BYU is really good, man. I mean, that's not my first phone call to Tom up there in Provo and saying, hey, let's have a game. Um but I do think there are similarities between like us and UConn and us and UMass, right? Unfortunately, those are the opposite ends of the dang country, yeah. you know, so that doesn't help. But you play on each other's desires. You know, we've got to be desirable that, hey, man, we could, you know, have a good chance of beating those guys, right, candidly. So does that make you want to travel a little further if your chances of getting a win is increased? Um, you know, we've also done some unique things, um, like schedule two games in one year with Liberty and Hawaii. Yeah. Um, I noticed that. that was crazy. Yeah. And you know, people are like, you would have thought when we first did this, I got more things like, oh my God, you're, you know, that you're, I don't know, dogs and cats are living together and this is unheard of. I don't know. And I'm a former baseball player. I mean, you know, you play series all the time. You look at the NBA, they're playing each other seven times in a row. I know it's atypical, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's going to uh, undermine one of the pillars of college football if you play an opponent twice. And it's worked out well for us. So there's little ways of getting games um, like that as well. So, um, that's yeah, so that's, yeah, that's a uh, little that's bit. That's some of, good uh, inside baseball stuff on how to schedule a football season. Yeah, so I appreciate yep. it. Um, no well, I was thinking about this, and then I want to move on to uh, to just spend the rest of the time talking about um, your consumables and, uh, revenue, but so this thought process of if the college football expands to 12 teams, maybe not for New Mexico state, but for in general in college athletics at the FBS non-power five, do you think that's going to make it harder to actually schedule, uh, these, these automatic money games, or do you think it actually wants to bring it back because some of the power five teams will be looking for, um, you know, a game that they can win without risk? Great question. You know, we're always, we, 
we were always the beneficiary, I think, at independence of like the Big Ten when they would maybe philosophically not play FCS opponents and they wanted to play just FBS opponents. So, you know, I can't read the tea leaves, but if, if, this, if this expansion causes teams to reevaluate their schedule and want to just play FBS opponents because we're, we're worth more as a win, you know, in the calculation, uh, that would be the greatest thing in the world for us. Because right now, you know, sometimes it's a buyer's market, sometimes it's a seller's market, you know, and uh, it just depends. Um, you know, for us, you know, I wish we were looking for a power five opponent we could maybe sneak in and get a win from. You know, we, um, but our philosophy is who's going to pay us the most? And that's why you see Alabama on our schedule and a lot of SEC schools because they pay the most. You know, this year we're paying Alabama and Kentucky. Well, that's not conducive to having a, a you know, a winning record, right? You're not going to beat SEC teams on the road when you're New Mexico State too often. Now, you have to factor that in when you're evaluating a coach. You have to factor a lot of things in and you have to acknowledge that, hey, the football team is, is helping keep our department FBS and, and keeping our department, you know, from a financial standpoint, you know, solvent. So um, I don't know what's going to happen um, during the expansion, but I hope um, it leans in the favor of New Mexico state with FBS games being more desirable than FCS opponents. And, and it's probably important to note that I bet most of your football players really like having those games on their schedule and it's probably good oh. for recruiting. Well, look, there's no doubt. I mean, a lot of people will take their jabs. You know, oh my God, New Mexico State is playing uh, Alabama, da, 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 da. Well, hey, look, man, I was on the field. First of all, those dudes are monsters, you know, and they're fast monsters. But our kids loved it. They love being out there and competing. And, I mean, it's not just lifelong memories. Hell, we scored 10 points against them, right? I don't know what it was, 62 to 10 or something. But, yeah, we certainly use that in recruiting. You were going to play at an SEC stadium. And you talked to Jaleel Scott. Jaleel Scott uh, uh, played for the Jets this past year. He got drafted by the Ravens. One of the reasons why Jaleel Scott got picked up is he had a ridiculous ESPN for the year. I think it was like top three, a one-handed grab in the corner of the end zone in, you know, one of our first games. And then he went off against Arkansas. He had like eight catches for 125 yards. He was torching them. You know, and they're like, I'll never forget the, I won't mention his name, but one of the coaches that I was friends with at Arizona State is like, he came over in warm-ups. I'm on the field. He was on the field. We knew each other from a previous institution. He goes, who the hell's that guy? And I'm like, yeah, well, that's a power five guy. You know, but just because he looked good, when he excelled in those games, that's when people said, hey, we can, we can, you know, we need to take a look at this guy. He's not just you know, doing these stats, he's doing it against really, really good power five schools. So, yeah, I think that's what all the student athletes, um, you know, hope for when we, when we play those games. Yeah. Let's uh, let's move to um, what you've been making waves for. I, I would say with uh, you all have licensed your athletic brand identity to be attached to a beer, a wine, whiskey, coffee, and a candle, uh, and then you've also just had a new venture with, uh, with the license or not licensing, but um, a tequila company brand. So this is creative revenue stream that seems to be slowly adopted by other institutions across the country. So maybe you probably have told this a hundred times, but not on this podcast. So what is the founding story behind these ideas of when it started with the beer? I know it was, I think was first. And do you think also if COVID didn't happen, would this revenue stream have it had expanded or would you think you maybe would just stuck with the, the initial product launch that, that worked? Yeah, really good questions. I'll tell you how it all started. Uh, in 2016, you know, we got a visit from our licensing guy um, at the collegiate licensing company. And in that meeting where we cover a lot of ground, he said, well, what do you think about consumables? I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? And one of the things he said was beer. And I said, Man, that's really interesting. We had just came back from Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, Brian Maggart's the AD. We were together at Mizzou. And one of the things I got was a, um, a Raging Cajun beer. 
And I had it on my shelf. I'm like, no, that's pretty cool. And I said, well, let me see. So I asked the president who was our, at the time at New Mexico State, the former governor, Gary Carruthers. I said, what do you think about this? And he goes, eh, I'm not saying no, Gary liked a, a beer or, you know, wine. And just so happened that some Aggie alums owned a company called Bosque Brewing Company. And they were right across the street from the university. Their main, their main hub was in Albuquerque. And they had created this blonde ale. And they didn't have a name for it. And just at the time we were talking to them and they said, yeah, this is something we would be interested in. So we got them signed up through, um, through um, the collegiate licensing company. We came up with a name. Uh, we utilized uh, somebody from the university, um, an upper level marketing professor to query the kids and kind of kept them to silence. So we decided to call it uh, 1888 Ale. That's when the school was founded. You know, the can uh, was crimson and white. We have the fight song on the back and Randall Dominguez made up the, the artwork and all that stuff. And um, we launched it um, in 2017. And at the time, it was about the fourth or fifth collegiate beer. And I couldn't believe it. All three TV stations came out from El Paso and Telemundo. All of our donors showed up. It was like this raucous party. People couldn't buy it fast enough. And, you know, it was only available in kegs at the time. And then um, Bosque came up with the canner, with the ability to can it. And um, it just so happened that, you know, all this stuff is right around the first bowl appearance in 57 years for the Aggies in Tucson, Arizona. And people went crazy for it. Um, you know, we win the game and over time, we got 25,000 Aggies at the game. And the thing shot up and Bosque, which was a small independent brewer, they ended up uh, making a deal with the Coors Miller distributor, Admiral Beverage. Now, there's only one in our state, right? When I was in Illinois, you had all these different distributors for the different areas. In the state, it's one, Admiral Beverage. So their trucks go all the sta statewide. So I get these reports and I'm like, wow, Pistol Pete's 1888 is in 300 stores in 70 cities in, this, in the state of New Mexico. And people are buying this and buying this and buying this. And um, at the end of, not this year, but the previous year, we made $30,000 on licensing revenue. We made it through the beer. I'm like, wow, that's pretty amazing. I looked at my Olympic sports my highest, not football or men's basketball, but my next highest sport, volleyball, made $27,000. So I'm not trying to equate it, but I spend some of my time trying to figure out how to get 1888 in the local Albertson supermarket and how can I get it in Walgreens and all that stuff. So, um, you know, the pandemic hits and I had all these ideas, you know, we wanted to do a wine. And, um, they, and our, our biggest wine grower was here. He said, hey, you know, we'd like to do it too, but you got to grow the grapes, takes a few years, fine. Didn't really think about it. Well, the pandemic hits in March of 2020. In April, I get a call and he says, hey, those grapes are done. We still want to do that. Are you interested? I'm like, heck yeah, I am. So, um, you know, we invented, I guess, you know, Pistol Pete's Crimson Legacy, a Cabernet Sauvignon. There was about 11 schools in the country that had a collegiate licensed wine. And even though it was the pandemic, we had a socially distant event and people went crazy. They bought wine by the case. They were given it as gifts and wine is unique. Unlike beer, you know, you can sell it on the internet. You know, it's, it's around like 40 different States. So people were, you know, we got the TV coverage was awesome. Well, then right across the street from the winery was a small little distillery called dry point distillers. And, um, I, I talked to the guy, uh, actually my wife and her friend were down there and he said, yeah, I'd consider it, but I think it's really expensive to do. And so I, I talked to him, I go, no, it's not expensive. What do you think? I go, well, I'm going to have to do a sales job here because no other school in the country has this. So now I have a new president and I say, Prez, you know, we've got the beer, we've got the whiskey. I think this is going to be really popular. And um, he said, he, we finally get the okay. And, you know, in order to make whiskey, that's multi-years as well. I'm like, well, we don't have that time. So we actually farmed out a three-year-old rye whiskey um, from Indiana. And we came up with a name, uh, Pistol Pete Six Shooter. Um, and just like the beer with the fight song, the wine tells a nice, unique little story on the back of New Mexico 
and New Mexico State's involvement in grape growing. And then, you know, we made up a nice little story about the Old West and Pistol Pete, and it was a really nice looking bottle. So we had, uh, this is November when it finally came to fruition, right? We had the conversations in April. Now, November, it's finally in a bottle. And the day before it was supposed to go out, um, we had two small donor events. He's got a small place. We, had, or we invited nine couples from 5.30 to 7, cleaned the place, and then 7.30 to 9, and everybody was socially distant. That first night, and then you could buy the bottles right there. The first night, we sold 96 bottles. The second night, we did the same thing um, on Thursday, two nine-couple deals, and we sold 75 bottles. So now the guy is going to go out, the owner, um, Chris Schaefer, and he's going to put the bottles in, you know, some local liquor stores. And I've got, we've got a camera team following him, right? Because we're putting all this stuff on social media. Well, he drops off this stuff at Kelly's Liquors at one o'clock. And our team is with him in the van. And on, on the way to his next stop at 120, he gets a phone call from the owner. He's like, can you bring back some more? Because we've already sold out. People went nuts. All the TV stations were there. Whiskey Advocate, which is the country's largest publication on whiskey, did a glowing story on this. And we were running out right before Christmas. And we ended up making a, a, um, a waiting list. And I, I had donors upset at me, texting me and calling me. This is an outrage. Where can I get my bottle? I'm like, wait a second. This is supposed to be a happy thing. And they're pissed off. Uh, we had 650 waiting lists for the bottles. Uh, so finally, we reorged, and it's been a great success story. And then, yeah, we launched the candle um, and uh, our coffee, and we've got a couple other projects that we're working on. But as you said, you are 100% spot on. The one lone bright spot of the pandemic, or one of the very few, is that it gave us some time to work on these projects that we had on our to-do list, but never really had the time to, to bring it to life. Yeah, gosh, it's just, um, you know, I, I think that it's just so creative because, I mean, I think we all grew up and go to the stores and the local store and you might see the T-shirt with the logo, the school on it you can buy. Um, but, you know, it used to be such a hard selling point to get alcohol sales approved. Then now it's becoming more normalized in most institutions. And it just seems the timeline worked out. And yeah, I also... Um, I think I read that you just held a taste test for a branded salsa product. Uh, is that just because you, you liked salsa that much or you all just, sure. someone came up with this idea? You know, we're an ag school and uh, it's a very unique situation. The secretary of the department of ag, the head honcho who sits on the governor's cabinet, his office is in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I'm friends with him, Jeff Whitty. And uh, he's a big Aggie fan and he sees all these products and he's like, Hey Mario, I want to talk to you you're doing such a great job. I want you to start doing this and repping New Mexico agriculture. I'm like, heck yeah, let's do it. So there, you know, chilies are the big thing out here. And I said, Hey, I won't get into this unless I'm partnering with you. Cause I'm not just going to willy nilly pick a chili company and make a salsa. So they have a, they have this big list of 54 salsa makers and so on and so forth. And we um, work with our licensing company. We had all this criteria. We want them to sell them you know, statewide, we want to have a national sales opportunity, blah, blah, blah. And we finally got it down to five or six. And we had a panel of judges. We had a state senator, uh, Crystal Diamond, who's a big ag person. We had the uh, dean of the uh, College of uh, Agriculture. He was a judge. Jeff Whitty, the secretary of ag, was a judge. My head men's basketball coach, Chris Jans. Um, a prominent local um, meteorologist, Monica Cortez, who's an alum and Dino Cervantes, who's a big alum of ours and owns Ubers of acreage in, in New Mexico and Mexico. He's the largest producer of pepper mash in the world. So like that, when you're eating hot wings at Buffalo Wild Wings, Hooters, you name it, um, you're eating his pepper mash. Um, so we had this esteem panel of judges and uh, yeah, we'll be launching that relatively soon. We'll be launching a... Uh, a, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we're a big pecan producing region. So we'll be doing something there. We've talked to dairy farmers in Portales, New Mexico. Um, so yeah, it's, here's what's interesting about it. This fiscal year just ended. 
and collegiate licensing said, Hey, you made 30 grand off the beer last year. You made 36 grand this year. You had a 20% increase in a pandemic and you had no games in your state and you couldn't really advertise and everybody's staying at home. So I felt really good that when we come up with these products and it's a little bit of a pain to birth it, but once the baby is here, the baby's kind of self-sufficient. You know what I mean? I don't have to, the only thing I'll do is to try to get it into more stores if the, you know, the, if the creator isn't as aggressive as I am. But really, once the product is created, if it's a good product, it kind of sells itself. So that's what's great about that. What I really like about it is uh, the theme there is not just the creativity of the revenue generation, but it's very tied to the community. Everything you've talked about is because it was part of New Mexico. And, um, and so that's, that seems to be, it's almost like a land grant mission uh, type of thing where I don't even think you guys are the land grant of your state, unless I'm wrong. We are. But, oh, yeah, you no, are? We, so there you go. Yeah, we're the you land grant. You could say it's fulfilling the land grant mission then. Yeah, we talk about that. I, you know, I always say this, it's a win, 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 because, you know, you're dealing with small businesses, whether it's Bosque Brewing, DH Les Combs Winery, um, or Estas Manos Coffee Company, um, or Dry Point Distillers. Those are all four owned by alums, right, of New Mexico State. They're all small businesses. You know, they're, everybody's kind of hurting in the pandemic. Uh, it's a feel-good item that a lot of the alums like to say, hey, I'm helping out the athletic department. Hey, this is neat. I'm going to serve it at my alumni parties or whatever. So, yeah, there is not a whole lot of downside. You talked about the alcohol. I think now there's over 25, you know, collegiate beers and I'm working on getting every single one of them. I, my claim to fame is I have the best collegiate beer collection in the United States of America. I'm only missing like four, four of them. I think Ross B. York tweeted because he was on that. He was the first person I ever had on the podcast. And I think I saw him tweet out once uh, that he had one of your guys' beers um, in his office on display or something like that. Yeah, he, he sent me one. Um, so I'm, I think I'm missing Memphis, Nickel State, and uh, maybe Nevada. That's it. I need I need to start this trend where I just some people uh, collect pennants on their wall. I need to start collecting beers too and just keep them in the background of the podcast. Yeah, no, I tell you what, I've got them all in my office, and it, that is what ninety percent of the people gravitate to and want to look at the different bottles and all that stuff. So yeah, it's been uh, it's been pretty. That's popular. awesome. Well, so the, the possibilities almost seem endless. Did you just, do you just like go to the grocery store and just see, uh, see these ideas pop in your head? I mean, what, uh, what is kind of, is there anything, another consumable that you want to do? Yeah. Well, you know, you could do any, anything. Um, you know, there's, there's peanuts, right there. I mean, you just think of any of the agricultural products and chili is very unique, right? You think salsa, but they actually sell chili as a, as a vegetable, you know, a canned vegetable. Um, you've got hot sauces, you've got powders, you've got a lot of different things. So um, I think at the end of the day, if you find somebody who's willing to do it um, and it's a good product, you can have fun with it. You know, um, Lord knows we're not taking our eye off the ball, but athletics should be fun. And, you know, we have aligned ourselves with Cantera Negra Tequila Company. They're the official tequila of Aggie Athletics. Well, next Thursday, we invited all of our top donors and they're all RSVPing yes. We're going to, you know, have a big party and we're going to just talk a little bit about the partnership and everybody's going to mill around. And, you know, we didn't have sports for a year in New Mexico. I haven't seen our donors. I want to get them jazzed up before football season. So, you know, these are things are so valuable as a reason to bring people together and have fun in a social setting and, uh, um, I'm just a little surprised more people haven't seen this um, as not just a revenue maker, but hey, man, look, $36,000 is now about $10,000 more than my highest ticketed Olympic sport. That's not a slam on the Olympic sports. Hell, I was a baseball player. I'm just giving you the numbers. We're at a school that desperately needs revenue. Hey, if this can get up to a hundred grand, that's a huge feather in our cap financially. And all that does is help our student athletes. So man, people love it and it helps our student athletes and it helps local businesses. Um, gee whiz, that's a, that's a pretty compelling story. 
How many uh, athletic directors or uh, uh, athletic administrators has reached out to you for advice on this? You should start charging. Yeah, no, I actually have gotten a couple calls. How do you do this? You know, the one big thing is, oh my goodness, if somebody drinks one too many pistol peats and gets in trouble, then the school, well, it's just like Coors or Bud or Miller or what have you, you know, we have, you know, our attorneys have said, look, just because, you know, we are licensing the product does not mean we have liability if somebody abuses the product. You know, we also try to have, you know, responsible messages um, with all of these type things, but yeah, it's not, um, it's not, uh, it's not rocket science, you know, and, and I think it can be fun. Um, and I think, you know, if you're an AD at quote unquote, this level, you're a little closer to it than, you know, at some other levels, um, you know, when you're at the power five level. Well, if you got time, I got two quick questions to wrap it up. Uh, uh, but this is great stuff that, uh, just really interesting. And, and so I imagine we talked about the consumables, uh, and that that category can almost be, you know, endless. Is there any, and this won't air for a few months. So you're not, uh, you don't have to worry about letting loose on too many things, but is are there other potential revenues that you think can be be brought into this industry that is completely different than that that you can have fun with? I mean, I, I imagine you're the type of person where you probably keep these ideas in your head and maybe you just you've got to you can only yeah. bite off so much at once. And right now you're riding that consumables. But is there some? I mean, I don't know what it would be, but or where do you pull and where do you pull your inspiration from when you think about that stuff? Sure. Yeah. Um, I wish I you know when people give me credit, they're like, man, Mario's great at hiring coaches. We're, we, you know, I'm like, yes, I keep the crystal ball under the desk in Las Cruces, but don't tell anybody about it. I mean, you know, they're, they're all a crap shoot. I wish I could sit here and say, Hey, you know, this is where uh, I think the next revenue stream is. I don't know if it's an alliance with student athletes, maybe in the NIL. Hey, we, we're in tight with donors. Hey, if, if I, if I'm the one that helps bring this marriage together, you know, you know, you give me 10% of that. I don't know. I'm just talking out of my head, but uh, off the top of my head, but um, yeah, I wish I could tell you my next secret inspiration um, other than the traditional things, you know, we want to add more premium seats, um, you know, things that will be a sustainable revenue model for the department. You know, I think we're forced to think about that, you know, as much as possible. Well, my last thing is uh, I, for, I'm in a doctoral uh, program and that's a big reason why I started the podcast. Um, and one project I had to do for my problems in financing higher education class, interesting semester to take that this last spring. Uh, hmm. uh, there was no shortage of problems in financing no, higher ed. I might need um, to enroll in that dang thing. <laughs> yeah, well, so we had to come up with a revenue generation idea that they think is eventually going to happen. And, you know, I, I pull from pro sports. And, and so I did one on uh, eventually I have a feeling that institutions will allow corporate logo patches on uniforms, uh, athletic uniforms. Um, you think about we sponsor everything else. And I'm wondering if things like that you think will happen one day, um, if it would be something that you could see other ADs talking about that could get behind. Because, you know, we already have the apparel patch. Pro sports has, has normalized it. It's huge for women's sports as well. I'm just kind of curious uh, if, if you've ever heard that discussion in college athletics or what you think about it. Uh, I think it's coming. Um, I mean, you know, we have stadium I, I, naming rights already. So, well, you have stadium naming rights. Look at even some of your more most prominent floors that have your coaches' signatures on it, and we do the Lou Henson Court. You know, we've got a corporate sponsor on our court. You know, there's corporate sponsors on the goal standards uh, or stanchions. So, um, yeah, I, I could not imagine that in a few years you wouldn't see. Um, schools, you know, trying to monetize, um, um, you know, every available space, including the jerseys. I know that, you know, I, I just don't think there's much that isn't sacred anymore that can't be touched. Now, that doesn't mean Notre Dame or Duke have to do that. But, you know, if it's allowable, um, we would probably jump all over that. Yeah, I'm just thinking, I mean, obviously, it'd be even more now than ever, the athletes would have to be involved in approving the corporation because you could have uh you know certain companies and individuals not wanting to wear it and that would obviously cause a mess but i just think uh, i got an a on the paper so uh if it comes back 
I'm going to put the paper on Twitter so everyone can see that I said yeah. this is going to come. So well, let me see it first so I can get dibs. Hey, I, I will send it to you. Uh, Mario Mocha, New Mexico State Athletic Director, thanks so much for being on the Higher Ed Athletics Podcast. All right. Well, Terre Haute to Bloomington. It's, uh, yeah, good to be on. Thanks for having me.